You have to be clear of your purpose and your goal because you can't have these goals down hidden away because if it's not in the front of your mind, something else will creep in there. In this journey that you're going to be on, there are going to be some ups, there's going to be some downs. But in the end, if your belief in yourself is unwavering, you will achieve everything you've dreamed of. Today, I will be interviewing Dr. Ivan Joseph, author of the book, You Got This, which is about mastering the skill of self-confidence. He's also known for his TEDx talk, which has over 22 million views, all based around self-belief. He's a keynote speaker and a leadership expert. So without further ado, let's jump into the video. So for people who don't know, just introduce yourself and what you do. Yeah, Ivan Joseph, current Vice President of Student Affairs at Wilfrid Laurier University. I also am a high performance coach working with high performing athletes. I coach the Guyana Women's National Team. I'm the high performance consultant with the Canadian Men's National Basketball Team. Amazing. So whereabouts did you grow up and how, how did you get into, how did you come over to get into the leadership stuff? Like was there, I guess there was a big gap in between. Yeah, well, you know, I was born in Guyana, South America, and so um, spent the first five years there, came and emigrated to Canada with my family. I will say I was always into leadership, meaning, you know, I stood out, I would say I was captains of teams, but there wasn't any formal leadership process that happened. Really what happened is I matriculated through those differing leadership spots. Um, it was um, as an, out an outcome of my failures that I started over. And then I got involved in a very small university that had a strong leadership program and really good role models and mentors that put me under their wing and intentionally developed me to be a leader. So, so what was your childhood like? So how, um, so you grew up in, um, Guyana. Guyana. Okay. So yeah. standard childhood or. Well, if you know Guyana, so Guyana is the tippy top corner of South America, right beside Brazil. So in today's world, you would call it an emerging country. Back then, you would call it a third world country, you know, meaning, you know, there was no like it was one of those typical Commonwealth countries that was colonialized. And so a lot of the power and influence was held with the whites. And so you had the blacks and the Indians, or what we call now Southeast Asians in differing positions. And so my area and my childhood, as best I can remember it, was not one of high affluence. And so my parents left typical immigrant story. When I was born, they left and went away to start over and left us to be raised with our grandparents. And so the first time I can remember meeting my parents, they left literally when I was two months old, was when I was five. And so we came to Canada. Now imagine coming to Canada and you don't really have a grasp of the English. In the Caribbean, you speak a, a, what's called patois, pidgin English, a, a combination of Dutch, French, English, Creole, Portuguese, all kind of mishmashed together. And so I stood out like a sore thumb in Canada. I remember getting in lots of fights, not because, you know, everybody was, um, I will say, out to get me, but, you know, I was different than everybody else. I lit, grew up in a predominantly white area. And so um, my parents were first generation. So where everybody had a sports car waiting for them at 16 years old and fancy jeans and all this, you know, club med, all inclusive vacations. You know, you're trying to keep up with that, but you're working behind the scenes to have your pair of jeans. You're working behind the scenes to do all these things. So I'll say my childhood was, I'll, if you were to come find it in one sentence, it was about hard work, trying to fit in and, and trying to get ahead. So then you're in Canada. How did you get into uh, soccer? Straight, was it, it was a soccer scholarship. So yeah. Did you get into it straight away? No. So, um, you know, one of the sports I could play, um, I had two that I was good at, soccer and track and field, all done through high school. You know, back then clubs were the way to go, but my parents didn't have the money for clubs. So my dad coached me in soccer and a high school coach who was a really great role model to me, Gary Boguski and Mike Shavalovich coached me in track and field. And so I became really good at those two sports. And I was the kind of guy that would get a ball on the wall and play by myself. But the school, I, you know, my parents aren't, you know, they're immigrants. They've made sacrifices. You're not going to go away to university and do sports. Are you crazy? That's, that's a waste of your time. And so I, I, I could not go and pursue that avenue. Even though I was after the year of my high school, I was, I was winning medals. I was ranked in Canada, all these sorts of things. So I went away to a traditional university and I 
failed miserably. I'm talking just too much freedom, um, not enough discipline, not enough structure, and I just bombed. And you know, one of the reasons I failed out is something I speak about in different talks, which, which was I didn't have the right role models and representation. That's somebody that took me under their wing and looked out for me. Nobody that looked like me and acted like me and said, hey, young man, you've got a lot of potential. Let's take care of you. Anyway, left to my own devices. Um, when I failed out, I was so ashamed, so humiliated. I didn't want to let my parents know, thank you for your sacrifices, but I wasted it. And so I needed to start over. And I called up a track coach and a soccer coach that I knew that had recruited me. And I said, hey, I know it's been a year. I would like to uh, come to the, your university now if you're willing to still have me. And they said, ha happily to have you. Um, you know, and so I, I went over to Grayson University in Iowa, small university, loved it and became a soccer track athlete and did school. So, and, and performed really well there, I'm guessing. You know what? It was, everybody has a right fit. And this is an important piece for your readers to know out there. I was lost in that big school. I needed a small school where my class sizes were 16, 20, 25. Some of them were as small as five or six, where I felt like I mattered and I belonged. If I wasn't in class, a professor would say, hey, where were you? If I wanted to participate in a play, I could still participate in a play. In that small school, I mattered, I belonged, meaning I made a difference. There was opportunities for me to shine and I, I wasn't just a number. And because of that, I got involved in other things. And the thing that really changed my trajectory and helped start me on this career as a vice president of student affairs is I, I became what was known as a house president. You might call them dons or proctors, the person on the floor who looks after all the other people on the floor. And that exposed me to a whole bunch of different leadership opportunities that opened my eyes to a whole new career that I didn't even know was possible. So when, when just before, before that, you were talking about um, missing that role model, like not having that person to, how important is it to one, be, be one of those people for other people but I would, I'd love to know your advice for people who can't find somebody who, who they feel fits the, the, the remit for them, the role model for them. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll share with you this story. You know, uh, you heard earlier that I was athlete of the year. I played every sport, you know, soccer, track and field, badminton, volleyball. I love sports. The only sport I never played, Jordan, was the sport called golf. Even though I worked on a golf course and could have access to free golf. The only time I really wanted to play golf was 20 years later after I had worked there in 1997 when I saw Tiger Woods win the Masters. When he won the Masters, I'm like, oh my gosh, I got to try this. And I got golf clubs for my birthday, for my Christmas, for like anniversary, and I get, became addicted to golf. Nobody said to me, hey, you brown guy working here, raking the, the sand pits and mowing the grass, stay away, you're not allowed. Lots of people invited me, but for some reason, I... I limited myself. I said I wasn't good enough or no, 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 we don't play golf. And so it's, we don't even recognize when we're in positions that if we don't see somebody that looks like us, how much we hold ourselves back. And so that's a big segue to say how important it is. And so the thing is, is then, okay, you got to find somebody and you're not going to come by accident. You got to be willing to put yourself out there and risk and say, I am looking for a mentor. Would you be willing to meet with me once a month, once every two weeks? And the thing is, that's really important is when you're looking for a role model and mentor, you have to ask, but you have to go prepared. Here's what I would like to talk about today. Here's what I'm looking for. Hey, I'm just really interested in how to become a president. Here I am a vice president. When I was at just not so long ago, I have a mentor that's a president. And when I show up, it's like, I'd really like to be a president in five or seven years from now. Do you mind if I just pick your brain with different questions every time? And then I always ask, and, and my mentor session is, hey, how can I help you? A mentorship experience doesn't have to be all one way. The mentee can also add value, but you have to be willing to ask. You have to be willing to be prepared. And with everything, some people are going to turn you down because they may not have enough time for you, but that's okay. Don't pick somebody with fancy status and title. Pick somebody that really has time for you and is really committed to helping people grow and develop. I love it. So, I mean, I think mentoring is one of those things that's so overlooked, like people just don't search for it. Um, yeah. Could you just expand on like the, the importance of having a mentor? 
Yeah. Well, I'll say here's from the corporate center. Do you know that if you have a, if you, um, organizations in the corporate world that have a mentorship, a formalized mentorship program, the people who get involved in them typically make anywhere from 12 to 24% more um, compensation, right? Well, how about those people, if you're a racialized person in an organization, you're nine to 12% more likely to get promoted into a leadership role if you're a part of a formalized mentorship program. In short, mentors help you connect and engage in an organization. They help you say, here's where the pitfalls are. Here's the political landmines to avoid. Here's how this process works. They speed up your knowledge by years by connecting with a mentor and help you avoid pitfalls. Equally as important, they help bolster your confidence. They, rein they reinvigorate, they reinforce your thoughts and they're a good place to vent and get all like, oh my gosh, you have this. And a good mentor is like slaps you upside the head and says, hey, stop, they're right. Here's what you need to be thinking about, slow down. Those things, the people that can speak truth to you that are authentic and genuine, they're invaluable in your career. Speaking of uh, mentors, like again, back, back to the early days of for yourself, you didn't feel like you had a, a person that was uh, relatable to yourself, so that meant that you didn't have that mentorship early on. How important is it to be the to break through and be like the first black golfer um, or recognizable one like Tiger, um, like in any in all different walks of life? Like, how important is it to try and to to walk those paths where people haven't done it before, but it's going to lead for other people and it's going to, it's going to lead a, a trail for other people. Well, let me answer your question this way, right? Cause I don't want people to feel like if they're in a, they have to achieve something with grandiose style and title and status in order to add value. Right? So I will say that it's important no matter what role status or title that you have to remember the people who helped you get there and understand your obligation to lend a hand backwards to help others forwards, right? In the Caribbean culture, we have this word called Sankofa, S-A-N-K-O-F-A, -A, meaning it's looking forward as well as reaching back. And so whether it is the title or the status, it's always important, no matter what your role is, what, how you can help others with an opportunity to get in the door, right? Now, in my role as a vice president, I feel the weight of that obligation and responsibility even more so because I have the opportunity and the impact to do it at scale. Meaning instead of as a soccer coach, I could give one or two people a scholarship. But as a director of athletics, I could give 15 or 20 people scholarship because I changed the way that role is. As a vice president, I now could give 4,000 people scholarships. And so the scale, the higher you get up there is equally as important. Now, and this is the most important thing, is do we have a responsibility or how important is it to, at, at, I'll say, achieve at the highest ranks? I balance, I battle with that as a 50-year-old man. Is it really important to climb the ladder to achieve at the highest rank? Or is it really important to be really good at what you do so that others see you as excellent and want to then aspire to be you? That's where I would probably leave that question. Yeah, insp inspiring action, like inspiring change through action. So even, I mean, we can see it in everyday walks of life. It could be somebody who works really hard uh, at their job, but it could just be the, the mundanest of jobs, but do, doing that task with a sense of purpose and a sense of fulfillment is so important, but it's, it's so difficult for some people to find that sense of purpose and that sense of fulfillment What's your advice for people who are struggling with that kind of thing? Oh, it's a great question. And so I always talk about finding your purpose. And I'll, and I'll say it this way. When you have a clear sense of purpose, you're not working anymore. You're, you're, not, you're not dreading getting out of your bed in the morning or opening up your car door in the parking lot and climbing this, the stairs to get to work. But people understand, well, I don't know what that is. And I don't, look, I don't know what that means. And the question I always ask people is, what are you volunteering to do right now? What are you doing in your spare time? What is it that the last time you did something and time just flew by? Oh my gosh, that doesn't even feel like work. You know what? When I have all these other things to do, I usually do this thing first because it just gives me joy. That's how I became a soccer coach. And the advice gave, given to me was stop pursuing status, title, and money. 
do what you volunteer to do and success and excellence and the money will come. And I remember dropping out of deciding to go to medical school and said, you know what? Yeah, you're right. I think I'm gonna become a soccer coach. Now imagine telling your immigrant parents who've sacrificed everything for you that you wanna be a soccer coach. What? You wanna what? You wanna kick a ball around? But because I never felt like I was working, I read everything about soccer. I watched every video. I studied everything I read. Didn't matter if it was a movie about Lion King, there would be a line there that I could apply. It didn't matter if it, I was watching a corporate video on, on Honda about Kaizen, Kaizen and excellence. I thought how I could apply that to soccer. And so by doing and pursuing something that I loved, my passion, I was able to be resilient because this is my passion doesn't mean that excellence happened right away. I was able to weather downturns and rejections and all these things because I loved it. And I didn't care about what material wealth or status. And then all of a sudden, I became really good. And in 10 years, I became the highest paid athletic director, the highest paid soccer coach in the country, all because of my pursuit of my purpose. How, how do you, so I mean, for me, that is more, that's an amazing explanation for it. But there are those people who feel so trapped in, in their work, in their day-to-day -day job, in their lifestyle. Like you say, the, the reaching for status as well. Like how, how do we drop that? How do we get rid of that? It's hard because, you know, there's, you, and let's, let's be quite clear. You got families, you got mortgages, you got car payments. It's hard. Number one is in order to pursue your purpose, you got to recognize it takes courage and you have to be willing to sacrifice. And so just like anytime you learn a new skill or you learn a new tactic, your lifestyle, your quality of life, your material things will probably go down. You might have to, just like the perp, I had a per person who gave up his corporate job and decided to become a coach. And he was making $400,000 a year when he sold his house, he sold his car, and he became my assistant coach for $6,000. And five, for five years, he became an assistant coach because he wanted to learn. Fast forward 10 years later, he's coaching in the MLS, making more money than he did as a corporate person. So I will tell you, yes, I don't want to mislead any folks that are out there. It's scary. Your quality of life in terms of material possessions will probably go down. But your quality of life in terms of health, well-being, stress, hope, optimism, happiness, Will, will go way beyond anything you imagined. And I tell you this, the people who pursue hope, optimism, and purpose live way longer lives, have way less stress, recover from injury and surgery quicker than anybody else. So by the time you look at that big house, that mortgage, that fancy car, you got one life to live and it's a choice you got to make. I, I absolutely love that. Um, so now I, I wanted to talk about sort of the road. So let, let's say we start when you started being a coach, there was a load of things that you put in place to become successful at that. One of the things I really like um, that you spoke about, about like what you do with individuals and teams is deflecting distractions, which is so difficult in, in the sort of world we live in right now. We can get distracted so easy. Like what is, what's your advice? What's the, have you got any sort of, um, techniques or programs that you use to sort of deflect those distractions to stay focused? Yeah, well, I think the first thing is to be, you got, before you even get to distractions, you have to be clear of your purpose and your goal, right? Clear of your purpose and your goal. And so, you know, what is your goal? You know, win the national championship or what is your goal? Um, earn this managerial job. What is your goal, right? Uh, be married by the age of 25. Whatever your goal is, and then it's important to recognize, okay, if this is the goal, what are the steps that I really need to do to accomplish that goal? You know, and so sometimes let's say the goal is, I'm making it up, but I, I want to lose 25 pounds. That's my, like, I want to feel good about myself. My goal is to lose 25 pounds. Well, what do I got to do? I, I, you know, I'm not going to eat past seven. I'm going to drink four glasses of water a day. Uh, I'm going to exercise 20 minutes every day, whatever those things are. And all of a sudden now, you know, you've got this clear roadmap. The thing is, we sometimes put this clear roadmap only in our head. I want to write it down. I, you know, when I'm losing weight, on the front of my fridge is my goal. And then it's my weigh-in number and my graph every day. 
because you can't have these goals down hidden away. They got to be front and center by your mirror, by your computer screen, by your refrigerator, by your work desk, wherever it is. So it's always at the front of your mind, because if it's not in the front of your mind, something else will creep in there. Right. Oh, my gosh. My goal is to is to to get this manager job. I got to finish this project. Hey, let's go out to the bar, guys, and party tonight. And I turn and I look at my computer as like manager by age 25. Nope. Nope. I need to constantly remind myself and have it front and center what I'm about and what's going on. So that's one technique. Write it down and put it someplace where you're seeing. Number two technique, which is really equally as important, is who are you surrounding yourself with? Equally committed people who have that same drive and discipline and purpose. And you know, that's hard because sometimes like, but these are my friends, these are things I want. Who are the high achievers? right? Who are the people that are equally committed, who are good for you and good to you? Because we all will have this time where we just want to go this way. And they're like, hey, come on, let's do this. And you, everybody needs a wingman or a wingwoman, right? Just your motivator, your pipe woman, your hype man. Come on, come on, you know you can do this. So that's another important piece. Surround yourself with people who will build you up. Right. And that's hard because it's like, oh, gosh, sometimes I say it's get away from the people who will tear you down. But, you know, that motivation piece, you write it down. OK, I write it down, but I'm still not good. OK, here's my people. Number three, what are the distractions? Don't spend and wait for them to surprise you. When you set your goal and you set your processes, write down the things that you know that are your slippery slopes. No different than the alcoholic says, you know what, I'm going to be a dry, I'm going to be, a, you know, I'm, I'm not drinking any beer anymore. Well, what's a distraction? I can't go into Nelly's because even though they got the best chicken wings, they also got that bear I love. So you know what, I'm not going into Nelly's for rest that restaurant anymore. You know what, I'm not hanging out with Sally because Sally always drinks wine with her dinner. And that's just too slippery for me. What are your distractions so that you can see when they're coming? And what I call become the red flags. If I'm losing weight and I know that I'm going to weigh in every morning, okay, that's not bad. If I miss one, that's okay. But if I miss two, that's my red flag. So it's like distractions, red flag. What are your red flags that say you're about to go off course and you need help? And that says, let me get to my friend. Do you think write all this down? No, 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 it's brilliant. It's fantastic. Um, do you think write it all down, write the distractions down too, and that have all these things in front of you? Absolutely. Absolutely. Fantastic. Um, there was something that you mentioned just there, not giving people sort of your, your power, your energy, like not allowing people to take that from you. Yeah. Don't give your power away. That's, so it. I say, That's it. Yeah. yeah. So I say this about people who sometimes let critical people, negative people dissuade you from your goals. There's always people out there who are going to tell you you're no good that you don't have the ability. Are you crazy? That's a terrible idea. That why are you doing that? And all of a sudden, yeah, you're right. You're yeah, yeah, yeah. And as soon as you let them take over, then you've given away your power. And what I mean by that is you've listened to them and you've let them stop you in your tracks. And I'm like, what the heck? Who knows? Do you know? Like, imagine I remember it's like, um, you know, there's a lady one time that it's like, that's a terrible idea. I don't even know who you are. I just met you. You don't know anything about me. So I don't care what you think, right? That's the way I want you to look at it. Sometimes we think about it as like, oh gosh, yeah. Well, you must be an expert. You must be it. Yeah. I, I share the story of how I cut a guy three different times, three different times that I cut this guy from a position that I am the expert in. Like I literally coach people to millions of dollars in this. And he came back a fourth time and became an all Canadian a pro and is now still playing. If anybody was to tell somebody that he wasn't good enough, it, was, it should have been me. But that guy didn't pay any attention. He interpreted that feedback differently and he got away from me. When you know those people who are that are constantly wearing at you, if you're not careful, they start this downward cycle where they influence your thoughts, your beliefs and your actions. And so in order to stop that, you got to get away from them and not pay them any mind. How, how do you decide who is the one you should listen to and is giving you good advice versus the one you should ignore and carry on? Uh, that's a good question. So I always talk about negative feedback versus critical feedback. Negative feedback is always what's wrong, what's broken, why it's not happening, why it's a terrible idea. 
Critical feedback. Why it's wrong? Have you tried this? Critical feedback. This is what's broken. I could see this, this, and this. These are the issues that I would work to solve on. Do you see how they give you hope, a path forward, optimism, right? Critical feedback is supportive. I love where you're going, right? I could see the work that you put into this. Here are the issues that I think that are broken. Here's what I, you know, very specific, positive, that supports and motivates you to keep moving, right? Whatever you're asking, and sometimes we have to train people to give feedback. And so I say, okay, I got it. Do you have any suggestions? Do you have any thoughts about how I can move forward? I don't know. Why, that's why I hired you. You know what? You're not the kind of person I want to work for. Um, we talk like you, you train a lot of leaders. What is, uh, we could talk, I uh, guess, for hours on leadership. Um, but what's like the key? Like, what's the keys to it? Like, is there, is there a simple way of looking at it? Like what people need, uh, what people require? And is there something that you, you just have to have naturally or can we all develop that skill? Well, I don't know if there's, I'm an expert here, but I will say that from my training, there's certain things that I've noticed. Number one is um, everybody fee needs to feel like they matter and they belong. So you're going to hear that a lot for me. And that's about the power of cohesion, connection, whoever you want to say it. In, in the corporate world, they would call it engaged. If people feel like they matter and they belong, they're more likely to want to perform for you as a leader. So how do you make that happen? How do you create an environment where there's a closeness, there's a cohesion, where you know that Sally's grandma is sick, or you know if Bob shows up with two coffees in the morning, he's had a rough day? How are you going to spend time to create meaningful connections between your workers? And so you have to develop that in order to grow and build loyalty and make people want to do things beyond the scale of their job description. All right, so great leaders have that ability. Number two, feedback, 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 right? Great leaders give feedback. People crave it, they yearn for it, they want it. And they don't want just warm, positive feedback. The, you know, they want the critical feedback, but they want it genuine and authentic. Don't give them warm feedback if it's not really meaningful. You know, if I say it like this, the guy that shoots on goal, great shot but it was wide and 10 yards over. They, they, you don't really mean any of that, right? So don't say great shot when it goes five yards wide and 10 yards high. Save it for when it really means something, then they will know that, you're, that your feedback is genuine, okay? Third piece that you have to really be able to do is communicate, communicate, communicate. And this is different than you know, feedback, which is different than um, cohesion. What I mean by that is, are you clear in your communication? Are you articulate? Are you able to set a clear mission and vision through you the way you communicate? Mm, rough. Mm, mm. Don't, and recognize that in order to communicate, it has to be proactive. You have to be out in the spaces, sending out whatever those key messages are. We think about messaging only as one time, but I usually try and give the same message three to six times because communication, check what you, you know, tell me what you just heard. Are we clear on the same message here? Those are the, my kind of my three things, right? And, you know, and I connect communication to that clear mission and vision. It's kind of all one. I'm going to take that. I'm going to take that with me because, I mean, we, we've just expanded our team here. And it's like communication is, like, is so difficult. You, you don't, it's really hard to realize that where you're making mistakes. Um, so yeah. I'll take a lot of that with me. Um, uh, we, we hear about success, especially like in, on social media and stuff, I see a lot of self-made. And what we've been speaking about already, there's a huge team behind it, whether we like it or not, mentors, um, yeah. coach. So like what, the notion of self-made, like is, is success, or what, however someone defines it, is it possible to do on your own? Or do you need these, these support systems and teams behind you? I would say that no one does anything alone right? Nobody, you don't get there without somebody opening a door for you, without somebody giving you advice. So I don't think that the team has to be formalized and structured. I think you have to be committed to excellence, but I don't, I think that you, if you think that you're doing it alone, then you're being selfish and you're not realizing how much advice you've, you've gleaned from somebody along the way, how many times somebody has maybe opened a door or a crack for you 
or how much reading that you've got from some, some resource here or some video there. You know, I, when I won my national championship, you know, I read everything by an Italian coach called Argio Sacchi. Argio Sacchi was this Italian coach who never played soccer. In fact, he was a leather shoe salesman. He was excellent. And so I tell you this because you don't need to have a marketing manager and a secretary and an administrator and all of this. It's helpful when you get to a certain size of organization and the scale of an organization to recognize what your strengths are. But to begin with, just recognize who are the experts around you and how can you tap them for advice. Now, you might have, you got to work like a dog at the beginning, right? But you don't you can still do it. I don't I don't have any big fancy team around me. So I, I really believe in the power of the people helping and lifting each other up. Okay, I'm really excited to jump into this next one because one, I think people um, lack it a lot and it's super important. So it's the self-belief. Um, you spoke about it before and just whatever you like, just give, give, give us everything because I think it is so important and I'm so interested in the subject. Yeah, well, you know, a lot of people see me as this national team coach, high performance coach, world championship, this, blah, 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 PhD, yada, yada, yada. I got cut from a soccer team so many different times. I got, I failed out of university. I hid my shame and my humiliation. And it, in fact, what it did is it stopped me performing. And I'll never forget the time my wife showed up one day at a practice and, and I was benched for about two months for something I did in a practice or a game where I cost it, the team a, um, a victory over a nationally ranked opponent. And she basically said, oh my gosh, why are you practicing so bad? You don't even like you, you don't even look like you want to be here. You're making so many different mistakes. And I was like, yeah. She, and she goes, why are you letting this coach do this to you? And I was like, huh, what do you mean? She goes, you told me that he's not a good coach. He's not, he hasn't played a lot. He hasn't got any licenses. Why are you letting him tear you down? And it was then I recognized this about this whole giving your power away and letting somebody else define my sense of worth. And the line she said is, why are you letting this coach tell you you're good or not good? Why are you believing him? Can't you see how it's making you change the way you play? I'm like, whoa. And it was right then and there I realized the power of what we believe really influences our actions or how we interpret somebody's perceptions of ourselves really interprets our belief systems and our actions. And so that mantra, thoughts influence your beliefs, influence your actions. I needed to stop all that negative thinking. I needed to stop all that self-doubt. And so I started studying self-confidence, the belief in your accomplishment, to ta you, the belief in your ability to accomplish the task at hand. Let me say that again, since I messed it up, the belief in your ability to accomplish the task at hand. And so I stopped that negative thinking. Oh my God, you can't do this. Stop it. Right. Oh my, I don't belong. Stop it. Right. And then I started really starting to believe. And I didn't just all of a sudden like, Oh, I can fly. It's like, no, I'm, I'm as fast as anybody. No, I can kick this ball. And then I went in there and I started practicing a little bit harder. I started training a little bit harder. I started working. I wasn't going to let this guy define who I was and what I was about. And when I did that, I started playing better. And then all of a sudden he couldn't say, no, you weren't good because I was winning the races. I was scoring the most goals. Fast forward, I became the captain in all conference on that team, a team that I never played on for months. And I recognized the power of self-belief. In psychology, we call it self-efficacy how that could change how we see ourselves and the things we choose to pursue. And so, so by doing so, I started changing the way I thought. I started when negative thinking came in my head, you saw me do these thought stopping exercises, stop, a physical action is stop it. And I replaced it with positive statements and affirmations. I got this, nobody outworks me and my all time favorite. I am the captain of my ship and the master of my fate. If you've watched my TED talk, you know that one. But then there's the science behind it. The science behind it, if you use three statements, three positive affirmations a day, and you're in the creative marketing world, you do artwork, creativity, product, collateral, you increase your productivity by 17 to 19%. I'm like, whoa. 
But then if you're in the diagnostic world, complex problem solving, you're something like 25 to 27% more uh, faster, more efficient in solving complex problems. Think about that from doctors or engineers or people who do logistics. But then if you're in the revenue generation of sales world, this is where it really hits the people. You're 35 to 37% more likely to increase your revenue by people who use three affirmations a day. I am the captain of my ship and the master of my fate. Nobody outworks me. I can learn anything. I use those to be automatic when I feel doubt and negativity coming into my mind. So that's a fantastic tool to use. Um, is there anything else for somebody who's really struggling with self-belief? And it is everywhere. There's so many people. And I think a lot of it is to do with taking on others' opinions and, and, and listen to others way too much. But yeah, is, is there a simple task that people can do to sort of start gaining that back? Yeah. Well, you know, you speak about imposter syndrome because we all get there. We get promoted and then it comes on again. Okay. Yeah. I was really good at my job as, as a coach, but now I became a director of athletics. Oh my God. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know. But then you get really good at becoming a director and then you become a vice president. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what to do. So yeah, this is natural. So first give yourself grace. The simple task I do is I write myself a self-confidence letter, right? A letter to myself, my personal brag sheet all the things I'm amazing at. And sometimes we're like, I got nothing, I don't know. I write it then, then reach out to your friends. Can you give me two things you like about me, right? Reach out to four of your friends and ask for two things they love about you in an email. And then put those things, cut and paste them and put them in one email and read that to yourself. I read my confidence letter to myself over and over and over again till that piece of paper became like paper thin, like just like a fabric. It was like cloth and cotton because I needed it. Oh my gosh, my letter went, you know, if you read my TED talk again, you'll see it. Ivan, congratulations on getting your PhD before you're 40. You chose the right woman to marry. She's been a big supporter of yours. You raised three great kind children. Nice job. All the things that I was proud of achieving. And what happens when you read that letter is it changes the chemistry in your body, what's called dopamine. So it's not just voodoo. Dopamine is what you call your happiness juice, your accelerant. It makes you feel really good. And when the dopamine is released in your body, you get this rush of endorphins that changes your mood and helps lift you from a, a, a downward spiritual cycle. Uh, I, I love it. I think um, I'm definitely something I'm gonna be doing myself. Um, recently for me, so we're filmmakers, we've been shooting this documentary at the moment and imposter syndrome has been so bad for myself. Um, so could you explain imposter syndrome a little bit more and just like what like and that's a fantastic task and anything any other advice you've got on on it yeah so just so we're all aware like we all achieve success in whatever role we're at and after a while what happens is people notice and then they promote us into a new area but when you were the expert in that previous role let's just say again you know, you were, you, were the, you were the secretary. Well, you knew how to answer the phones. You knew how to book the calendar. You knew how to use the software. Excellent. Okay. And so you feel good about yourself. You feel competent. It makes your ego and your sense of worth and your self-identity flourish. Now they've given you a new role. Now you're going to be the, the manager. Well, now you got to learn budgeting. Now you got to learn how to lead people and delegate people. And because you're such an excellent worker, you don't like making mistakes. And because you're such an excellent worker and people have praised you before about your ability and your skill, you don't wanna ask questions to let them know you don't know what you're doing. And so what happens is we have this fear that we're not good enough, that we don't belong. And somebody will find us out and you feel like you're just an imposter there that you're hiding behind. You've put on this costume and this hat and you don't want anybody to find out that you're not good. And so you're embarrassed and you're shy and you're timid. Get over it. Every single person goes through this feeling of feeling like they're not good enough when they enter into a new role or a new, or a new ability. I talked to a president at a university just the other day. Absolutely. This person has been on the job uh, four months and felt like, oh my God, I don't want anybody to find out. I don't know what I'm doing. This person makes $600,000 a year, has won many numerous allocations and awards. We all will have it as we move through the organization to different levels. And so recognize that and say, okay, I know it. It's going to happen. 
it's going to, on average, it takes people 18 months at a new role to feel like they have it, that they can master it. My headhunter told me the happiest and most confident and competent a person feels when they take a new job is the day they accept and sign the contract. Then it goes down, down, down. They start the job, it goes down, 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 down. Somewhere along the line between zero starting date and 18 months, finally it starts to change when you start to gain what's known as competency or mastery over the new skills. Okay, yeah, I know how to work this delegation. Okay, I finally get the budget. Yep, yep, okay, okay, I'm good at it now. And you may need to see it two or three times. The faster that you can go through it is the more relationships, more networking, the more questions you ask of people outside right, of you. And that's why those formal mentorship programs are so important. And they're not just for young people in an organization. I'm a VP and I have a mentor. Love it. Um, when, when people come to you for, for help, is there, is there anything in particular you see quite often that's like a really simple thing that maybe we're all walking around with and struggling with um, that would help us? Is, is there anything in particular that you see quite a lot? Well, I think the biggest thing people that come to me is they've just experienced failure. And they interpret that failure as the end of the road. Um, they interpret their setback as their doom and they don't reflect on the failure. And this is what I'm trying to get people to understand is that failure is part of the process, especially for high performers. I really believe that if you're not failing, then you're staying within a safe zone, then you're not really reaching peak performance. You're not really innovating. In order for you to really move an organization or yourself forward, you have to be willing to stretch and strike out a few times. You have to miss the mark a few times because it's in that uncomfortableness, that failure that you then reflect, what am I going to do differently? What do I need to do? That's where the growth happens. And so that's the big time. I spend a lot of time teaching people how to accept failure, how to embrace failure, and how to reflect on the lessons learned. That's to me a key of a high performing organization and a peak performing individual. So talking of failure, how would you tell somebody to accept it and, and how would you use that to move yourself forward afterwards? One of the things you'll, you'll um, hear is there's the researcher called Carol Dweck and she taught and she wrote a book about the growth mindset. And that thing is about not yet. Achieving a skill doesn't have to happen immediately. It means not yet. And so one of the things you've got to recognize is that your failure doesn't mean no. Your failure means not yet. So if it means not yet, then what do you mean by that? Well, now what's next? What am I going to try differently? What am I going to adjust? Because that's, if you get to the answer of not yet, then it means, okay, something needs to change. When you get to the answer of no, that means I'm done. And so that's the answer I want you to tell yourself when you fail at something. It's like, okay, not yet. Then I want to reflect, well, what are, the, what are the reasons why it wasn't not yet? What could have been possibly? And if you write all those reasons down, if you think about all those reasons, okay, I'm going to try this, I'm going to try this, I'm going to try this, I'm going to try this. All right. And then you've crossed it off. That doesn't mean it's going to happen again. Dang it, it still didn't work. Hmm. Well, I tried this and this and this. Not yet. Still, Why? If, if Gladwell or, or talks about the 10,000 hour rule or J.K. Rowling took what, 12, 15, 20 times to get her book published or Edison took thousands of times in a light bulb, surely I can take more than one or two times to persist in order to achieve my dreams. Yeah, I absolutely love it. And I think the thing is with failure is a lot of people are so fearful of it. They sit in that comfort zone so far away with it. Um, how, how would you advise someone to push up against it and start trying to get into that zone where they, they are on the brink of failure? Yeah. You know, there's a great book by, um, I think it's Spencer Blanchard that wrote, um, um, Who Moved My Cheese? And one of the mantras in that book is, what would you do if you weren't afraid? And that's this big piece is like, because one of, many, of our, many of us can't move forward because we have this tremendous fear of failure. And that is about what other people are thinking. When you're worried about failure, it's because you're worried about other people interpreting and looking at you. That's you getting out of your own shame, right? That fear of failure is usually about other people's perceptions. You've put so much weight 
on what they think and others think. I imagine if you had your close circle of friends that were there, and if you asked them, I'm going to try this, but it might strike out. I bet you the people who believe in you 100%, who are unconditionally got your back, would be like, yeah, who cares? Let's go for it, right? Here's your backup plan. Here's your safety plan if things go so. You, my sofa's ready for you. My, this is here. Here's a backup job if you need it while you're waiting, right? And so have a plan in place so that when you do fail, you got some place to land, right? But let go of other people's perceptions of who you are and what you should be and watch excellence happen. I really love that. Um, I just want to quickly step back onto your your three things that you tell yourself. Um, be the captain. Like, how how did you develop them? And what do they mean to you? And how should all how should other people seek their own? Yeah, you know, for me, I've always used affirmations as simple, genuinely true statements. Right. I'm not using an affirmation as I am a millionaire. Or, I am a billionaire. There are things that I have that I'm in control of. And they were specifically designed for, to combat the specific negativity that I was having. So for example, when I became a new athletic director and I didn't know what the hell was I was doing, I, I, got, I could learn anything. I would go to meetings and feel like a dummy. It's like, stop, I can learn anything, right? Okay, like, it was like, man, I would feel overwhelmed and everybody would be asking me things. And I'm like, I can't say no, I'm saying yes to everything. I'm, I'm, I'm overtaxed, I'm dropping meetings, I'm missing things, stop it, Ivan. You're the captain of your ship and the master of your fate. That reminded me, I could say no. I decided what I wanted to do, right? Nobody outworks me. When things didn't come quick and easy and it took me longer, it doesn't matter how hard it is. It doesn't matter how long it takes. I'm gonna show up early, I'm gonna show up, I'm gonna stay late. Right. I was when I was being paid so much, everybody wanted like, why? It's like nobody outworks me. I don't care how long it takes. My day started in the office at 630 and it ended at 630. Right. Sometimes nine o'clock at night because I was committed to being the very best. Right. There was no magic pill that from the Matrix, red, blue pill, Neo, that I could take. But I could do these things. I could learn. Nobody could outwork me. And I can remind myself that I am. And the captain of my ship and the master of my fate. Right? Real short statements. Commit them to memory and make them automatic. I love it. Um, how, how do we, how do we get someone who's struggling to, um, or, or how how does if someone aspires to get into sort of the mindset that you're in, that that hardworking mindset, um, how how do you achieve that? Is that something you've always had? No. No, it was not. Um, you know, that's why I failed out of university. Um, I didn't have it. And I, you know, I, I can't say, I would love to say, well, I put myself on a goal, right? That was it. For me, what happened was I hit rock bottom, right? All my friends went on to university. Um, all my people were doing really well. And I failed and I was at the bottom. Oh, sorry. And I felt the, sh <laughs> I felt the shame of it, right? The, the shame, the embarrassment. And so for me, um, there, I had no choice. So then when I said, okay, you know, I could blame everybody else for what, why I'm there, or I could look at myself. And so when I hit rock bottom, then it was about me taking accountability, not blaming the system, not blaming the man or the woman or somebody else doing anything to me recognizing that I was accountable for my behaviors and my actions. And that's when it started. Okay, if I'm accountable, then what am I gonna do to change it? And that's how I started moving into this driven path. Okay, uh, I feel like I could talk to you all day and, and pick your brain all day, but I think this is a really good one to sort of round, round up on. Um, is accountability, like super important. So many people are not holding, holding themselves accountable. So firstly, just like account, talk about accountability and uh, I mean, your opinions on it, if, if it is important or if it's not, I'd love to know. Yeah, well, number one, for sure it's important. You know, I spend a lot of time blaming others, um, you know, and when you blame others, then you're, you know, it's like, okay, whenever I lose a soccer game, you know, I always think about what could I do differently? What was my preparation like? 
What were the decisions that I made like during the process that I would reflect on and do differently? When you recognize that you are accountable, then you don't feel like you cannot ever achieve success or excellence. Then you recognize it's in your own hands. Recognize for me that being accountable means taking ownership over your actions, your thoughts, your beliefs, your friendship group, your work ethic, all those things. It doesn't mean that somebody else can do whatever, whatever, whatever. If you're unhappy in your job, you're accountable. Make the decision and find a new job, right? You know, I, I got to stay. My boss isn't. No, you're in charge. And so when I talk about accountability, it's not about blaming anybody else. It's that to recognize that you have the power and the influence to change your path, whatever that might look like. You can decide, you know what? I don't want a Porsche. I want a Honda. I don't want a Honda. I want a Porsche. So that means this is the path I'm setting on. The important piece about accountability is really hard is to give yourself grace as well. So don't say, oh, I'm accountable and then beat yourself up about all the mistakes that you've made. Say that I'm accountable to being learned, to be having a learning growth mindset. I'm accountable to improving my situation. I'm accountable to X, Y, and Z. It doesn't mean that you're perfect. It doesn't mean that you're without failing, that you will be like exceptional in everything you do. It means that you're willing to try and try again until the outcome is the one that you deserve. I love it. Um, Dr. Ivan, thank you so much. I just want to round up on this. Is, is there a certain thing you would tell your younger self, advice for your younger self? Mm -hmm. I would say this, you know, if I could go back 20 years ago and start all over again, I would tell myself this. In this journey that you're going to be on, there's going to be some ups, there's going to be some downs. There's going to be some good days and bad days, good months, bad months, and believe it or not, some good years and bad years. But in the end, if your belief in yourself is unwavering, you will achieve everything you've dreamed of. Enjoy the ride. Thank you so much. Honestly, I'm, I'm going to watch this back so many times. Like it's, it's given me so much. So I really do appreciate it. Um, and I feel like I could just do this for hours and hours. Um, so maybe we'll have to sort of hook something up again because I, I just appreciate your time so much. Um, thank you and I will finish it there. Thank you so much. Oh, my pleasure. If you want more, follow me on Instagram or Twitter or just follow me on LinkedIn. And I uh, I've got a book, You Got This. So happy to, happy to pass along any uh, more in, uh, nuggets in that book. You Got This, just quickly, You Got This. What's, what's it about? Like, what, what, what would people be reading? It's called The Skill of Self-Confidence, Mastering the Skill of Self-Confidence. It's a whole bunch of workshops and books and little um, practical exercises to gather lots of these things that you're asking about. That is, and I'll, that is all going to be linked down below. So please click it. Um, I'm going to be going through it all myself. And I think um, for us and our, our business as well, it's going to be massive. So yeah, really appreciate that. All the best, my friend. Guys, if you enjoyed the video like I did, please go support Dr. Ivan Joseph on his social media and also consider buying the book, You Got This. Uh, for me, it's definitely something I'll be purchasing. That conversation we just had has had quite an impact and I'm gonna start thinking about a lot of the things, especially here at Mulligan Brothers. Um, also, if you wanna help support us, there is some merchandise linked down below. It helps support the channel. Uh, Mulligan Brothers and Inspire Change stuff should all be down below. And if you want to support us even further than that and projects like this in the future, you could consider becoming a membership over at Mulligan Brothers main channel. It goes a massive way and we do not take it lightly. Like we really do appreciate it. Um, yeah, I just gained so much from that. So I'm going to give him a follow now. I'm going to go get his book. Uh, as always, thank you for watching. Oh, go follow me on Instagram at Jordan Mulligan River, at William Mulligan River for William, at Mercy for Mercy. Um, I'll pop them all up on screen and you can see what we get to on a day-to-day -day basis here at Mulligan Brothers. I hope you gained a lot from this. Have a blessed and productive day. And as always, go inspire some change. Peace.